Just how ancient is ancient Egypt? To give you some idea of how old this civilization really is, Queen Cleopatra, the last ruler of Egypt's final dynasty before the Roman conquest, died in 30 BC. That is closer to the 2020 release of Animal Crossing New Horizons than it is to the completion of the Great Pyramid in 2500 BC. I'm old, Gandalf. From the unification of Egypt around 5,000 years ago to the Roman conquest 3,000 years later, the civilization of the Nile remained remarkably consistent in its imagery and its traditions. Something else that's shown an impressive level of continuity is the fascination of other cultures with ancient Egypt. In the 2000 years since the ancient Egyptian civilization faded away, people have been intrigued by the artifacts and monuments that they left behind, and perhaps even more by all of the questions that they left unanswered. This phenomenon is called Egyptomania, and that's what we'll be getting into today. And yes, I will be using the papyrus font throughout this video, and no, I will not be taking constructive criticism on this decision. Welcome to Armchair Alchemy. I am the Armchair Alchemist, and on this channel I talk about all of the esoteric and intriguing topics that I cannot get off my mind. I know there's a bit of false advertising going on here, as the only seating I have access to is this serviceable desk chair, but hang in there, we'll get there one day and ascend to full armchair status. So this topic of ancient Egypt is one that is pretty close to my heart because I was not at all immune to Egyptomania. As a kid, I had a pretty intense ancient Egypt phase. I was very enamored with this shiny gold Egyptology book, just like all of these people on Tumblr, apparently. I saw the Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs exhibit at the Chicago Field Museum. I got the book from there, which I was constantly pouring over. As a cat person, the worship of cats, of course, spoke to me on a deeper level. I unironically loved the critically acclaimed 2004 film Catwoman, where the titular character gets her superpowers from a mystical Egyptian cat, which can do that for some reason. I don't remember. I was like eight, dude. Give me a break. When I was playing, I would incorporate Anubis and Bast and Sekhmet and Set into my games of make-believe because, you know, I was normal and they were super cool to me. It's, you know, honestly, it's a small miracle that I didn't end up a furry. So I don't know if they were at risk of becoming furries or not, but a lot of people throughout history have been similarly enchanted by ancient Egypt in a basically unbroken line from classical Greece up until today. When I learned this, it kind of blew my mind because I suppose on some level I sort of thought that the archaeological expeditions from the 19th and 20th centuries that we've all seen photos of, that this was when we really started learning about ancient Egypt. And Egyptology as a modern discipline more or less does date back to this time, but the history of Egyptomania stretches back a lot further. <laughs> First of all, even the ancient Egyptians were impressed with ancient Egypt, which considering that this civilization lasted for 3,000 years is really not much of a surprise. There's graffiti from Dynasty 18, which recounts how a day was spent admiring the Step Pyramid of Djoser, which by this time was already more than 1,200 years old. The ancient Egyptians also actively worked to preserve their own monuments. The fourth son of Ramses II is credited with relabeling tombs in Saqqara after the original inscriptions of the owners' names had been worn away. But the earliest written evidence we have of foreign interest in ancient Egypt comes from the ancient Greeks. In Greek myths, Egypt appears more than any other place outside the immediate region of Greek culture, which suggests awareness of and a fascination with this foreign land. Book two of Herodotus' histories, written in the 4th century BC, is the only contemporary record we have left of many aspects of 
of Egyptian culture. His discussion of mummification, for example, is the only surviving complete description of the process. But a lot of the information that Herodotus had access to came from local informants via an interpreter and was often intentionally exaggerated or false. Herodotus himself would embellish the stories to emphasize the difference between Egyptian and Greek culture, such as when he describes how the Egyptian women go to market while the Egyptian men stay home and do the weaving. And also, it really says this, the women peed standing up while the men peed sitting down. Beta cucks, am I right? Herodotus was also one of many Greeks who attempted to syncretize the religions of other peoples with the Greek religion. He argued that the Egyptian gods had spread into Greece in the distant past, with most of the Greek pantheon deriving from Egyptian originals. The Greeks believed that the Egyptians possessed great knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, and medicine, an idea which dates back at least to Homeric times. In Book 4 of the Odyssey, Egypt is described as a place where the earth, the giver of grain, bears greatest store of drugs, many that are healing when mixed, and many that are baneful. There, every man is a physician, wise above humankind. Egypt's scholarly reputation made it fashionable for Greek intellectuals to study with priests there. Several famous Greeks, including Pythagoras and Plato, are reported to have studied in Egypt. However, several classicists have later reached the conclusion that many of these reports of Greek scholars studying in Egypt were actually fictional. Some Greeks undoubtedly did go, but for many others, the claims may have been false and intended to enhance the authority of these thinkers' ideas by appealing to the alleged ancient knowledge of the Egyptians, a theme that we'll see repeated throughout history. After the suicide of Cleopatra VII in 30 BC, which we mentioned at the start, Egypt became a vassal state of Rome. During this Roman era, a tourist trade emerged that hasn't really changed much up until the present day. There were inns for weary travelers and contractors who would hire out boats and pack animals and tour guides to visitors who wanted to see the pyramids, temples, and tombs. The Romans loved obelisks. They would export them throughout the Mediterranean to erect them in gardens and squares. This probably started with Augustus, the first Roman emperor, who inspired rulers for millennia to come to get their hands on an obelisk of their own. Today, there are genuine Egyptian obelisks in London, Paris, and New York, just to name a few places. The Romans tended to incorporate the religions of peoples that they encountered into their own, and worship of the Egyptian deities Serapis and Isis became widespread in the empire. The mystery cult of Isis especially was immensely popular. Isis was a mother goddess who was associated with magic and healing. Her cult was a serious rival to early Christianity. It served a similar function of offering empowerment and the hope of a happy afterlife to ordinary disenfranchised people. Some scholars believe that the imagery of Isis holding the baby Horus may have influenced Christian iconography of the Virgin Mary with baby Jesus, or even that the veneration of Mary itself is a result of Christianity absorbing the Isis cult. Speaking of Christianity, during this later stage of the Roman Empire, it enters the scene, and as we've seen many other times throughout history, it immediately starts banning everything. In Christian Rome, Egyptian temples and statues were destroyed, old knowledge was labeled heretical sorcery, and symbols of the previously dominant pagan religions were labeled sinful and evil. The sole remaining keepers of Egypt's native tradition of writing, literature, and symbolism were the priests, but when their temples were closed down, this knowledge was lost. Roman rule in Egypt ended with the Muslim conquest in the 7th century, and the Arabic language eventually pushed away any remaining use of Egyptian. The Arabs knew less about ancient Egypt than the classical civilizations did, but they knew much more than the medieval Europeans, who were limited basically only to what they could read in the Bible. The Arabs were the most enlightened people of their day. They were incredibly interested in learning more about Egypt, which they viewed as a land of miracles and magic. 
However, the native Egyptians couldn't really tell them much because Christianity had stamped out so much of the religion, language, and culture. The Muslim Arabs distanced themselves from what they viewed as the idolatry and indulgent megalomania of the pharaohs, but the image of the pharaohs as privy to great knowledge and wealth persisted. The Arab scholars were particularly interested in the purpose of the Sphinx and the pyramids at Giza. And these monuments are, of course, still incredible to look at, but remember that in medieval times they were in much better condition than they are today and must have been truly stunning. Some people even went directly against the rules of Islam and venerated the Sphinx as a deity. The Arabs also started a trend of attempting to climb the pyramids at Giza. Europeans would later join into this, and pyramid climbing remained popular into the 19th century. Today, the practice is banned in order to protect both the pyramids and the dumb tourists from irreversible damage. So as I mentioned, in Europe during the Middle Ages, the popular image of Egypt came from the Bible stories of Joseph and Moses. On the one hand, Egypt was an example of what kind of punishments God could inflict on people who lived in sin, as we can see in the story of the Ten Plagues. But on the other hand, there was also kind of a positive view of Egypt as a place of refuge, because it was where Jacob and his sons had gone to escape the famine of the seven lean years, and it was also where the family of Jesus went to flee from King Herod, who was killing infants in order to totally wreck the prophesied new king of the Jews, who was destined to replace him. The purpose of the pyramids as tombs was forgotten. Instead, they were believed to be the granaries of Joseph. Simply not that big of a deal. Although some people who actually went to Egypt on pilgrimages and saw the sheer size of these things quickly changed their minds. However, as recently as 2015, the Republican presidential candidate Ben Carson was still touting this theory and saying that he believes that the pyramids are just big grain silos, basically, which... Yeah, my god. During the Renaissance, ancient texts that referenced Egypt were rediscovered, which sparked a new wave of interest in the Egyptian culture. Florence and Rome were the twin centers of Renaissance Egyptomania. Rome, in particular, was one of the few places where you could see genuine Egyptian artifacts without leaving Europe. The ancient Romans had imported a bunch of artifacts during their ancient Egypt phase. Monuments imported from Egypt were often inscribed with hieroglyphs, and the hieroglyphs became a topic of particular fascination to scholars. One of the texts that was rediscovered during this time was the Hieroglyphica by the 5th century Greco-Egyptian scholar Horapollo. This book caused a flood of attempts to interpret the hieroglyphs. Of course, the problem was that Horapollo himself could not read hieroglyphs and had assumed that they had allegorical meanings instead of phonetic readings, as is actually the case. The Renaissance scholars who were studying the hieroglyphs similarly assumed that they had some sort of deep significance or held the key to hidden wisdom, and these misconceptions would not be resolved until the discovery of the Rosetta Stone several centuries later. Some Renaissance scholars believed that there had been a single unified theology in the ancient past, and that this lost wisdom could be pieced together from recovered ancient texts. Egypt's incredible antiquity meant that any Egyptian sources were closer to this primordial tradition. And so the hieroglyphs and the pyramids and other Egyptian monuments were believed to carry some sort of hidden esoteric meaning. This belief became especially pronounced in the revival of Hermeticism. Hermeticism can be loosely described as a philosophical system of sorts. It's focused on striving for spiritual fulfillment through the revelation of ancient knowledge. It is based on the teachings of Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes the Thrice Great, who was allegedly an ancient Egyptian demigod sage, thought to be a contemporary or even a teacher of Moses. Now, the Greek god Hermes was identified with the Egyptian Tote, who was the god of writing, wisdom, and magic. And the sage who bore this name was in turn said to be a great astrologer, alchemist, 
artist and magician. Textual evidence would later prove that the Hermetic writings were not actually composed in ancient Egypt at all, but rather dated from the first few centuries AD during the Hellenistic and Roman times. But this hasn't stopped true believers from attributing hidden wisdom to these texts even today. Interest in mummies also emerged from the 16th century onwards. Eating pieces of dried mummy was believed to be a medical cure-all. And if you're asking yourself why, first I'd like to remind you that some modern people are still paying good money to eat dirt and other fun MLM contrivances. And second, the answer is naturally a translation error. The Arabic word mumia is borrowed from a Persian word, which means bitumen. Bitumen is an asphalt-like substance that was believed to have medicinal properties. The resin that's used to cover the Egyptian mummies resembles bitumen, so the word mumia, as it entered Arabic, ended up taking on the meaning of embalmed corpse or mummy. Somewhere along the line, the idea of mumia as a substance with medical potency was also transferred from the bitumen to the dead people. And so as a natural conclusion of this, people started eating dead bodies. As with anything where a profit can be made, fraud soon ended up entering the mummy trade. So modern corpses were covered in bitumen, wrapped, sun-dried like dead little raisins, and sold to Europe as definitely super legit, top quality Egyptian mummies. Egyptology as we know it today really began with Napoleon's expedition to Egypt in 1798. The purpose of the expedition was to strengthen French national interests and ensure that Great Britain was isolated from its colonies in India. But the expedition also brought along 150 specialists from an array of different disciplines. Among other things, these scientists drew and documented the Egyptian monuments and collected their findings in the massive encyclopedic work Description de l'Egypte, a work which Edward Said's classic Orientalism describes as that great collective appropriation of one country by another. A few years later, the discovery of the Rosetta Stone led to hieroglyphs finally being deciphered and changed the study of ancient Egypt forever. The publication of the Description and other similar works led to a huge Egypt boom in Europe, with Egyptian motifs being added to clothing, furniture, architecture, and art. During the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution was ushering in social change, so what was previously just the domain of the elite became accessible to the general public. The number of European visitors to Egypt greatly increased, as did the number of people who wanted to own their own Egyptian artifacts. As a result, Egypt was severely plundered as explorers were competing with each other to find the best and biggest artifacts to bring back to Europe. Many historical sites ended up being badly damaged in the process, and the severity of this rush for antiquities is reflected by the fact that it has since been dubbed the Rape of the Nile. Thousands of objects were taken away and sold to European museums, forming the basis of the collections in London, Paris, Turin, Berlin, and Leiden. This is a legacy that's still with us today. Egyptian authorities are still fighting to get these stolen treasures back into Egypt, but unsurprisingly European museums are resisting them every step of the way. The Rosetta Stone is consistently the most popular exhibit at the British Museum, and the Berlin Museum continues to refuse requests to return the bust of Nefertiti, even ones made as recently as 2020. The fascination with mummies also had a resurgence in the 19th century. People would host like mummies mummy unwrappings as theatrical events, where people would essentially pay to watch someone peel the rags off of an ancient corpse. Also, fun celebrity cameo. Joseph Smith Jr., the founder of The Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormonism, bought two mummies in 1835 and attempted to decipher the papyrus that was like tucked inside the wrappings of one of the mummies. Of course, he used his own techniques, which were very different from those used to decipher the Rosetta Stone, and in the words of one of my sources, his findings ended up being colossally wrong. The discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922 sparked a mass frenzy among the public, sustained by new mass media and production of Egyptian-themed 
anything for general consumption. You could just slap an Egyptian sounding name onto anything from like a musical composition to makeup, and it would be the height of 1920s cool. Now Lord Car- I don't know how to say this. Lord Carnivan? who had patronized the Tut excavation, ended up dying shortly after the discovery was made. This contributed to the popularity of stories about vengeful mummies and ancient curses. Throughout the 20th century and all the way into our times, ancient Egypt has remained a favorite subject of fringe historical theories and esoteric beliefs. Egypt's association with magic and hidden knowledge makes it appealing to enthusiasts of the occult, and indeed, secret societies love Egyptian imagery. Various Freemason and Rosicrucian groups have incorporated Egyptian imagery into the architecture of their buildings, their rites, even some of their origin stories, although it depends on uh, which group you're talking about. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who founded the Theosophical Society in 1875, titled her best-known work Isis Unveiled, and of course, this book promised to be a revelation of the wisdom that had been known in ancient times but lost because of Christianity and scientific materialism. The influential Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which we will be looking at in depth at some point on this channel, also used Egyptian symbolism and even like cosplay during their magical rituals. Now, some people are less magically inclined and instead prefer to focus on alternate historical theories. These theories are usually grouped under the name alternate Egyptology, although some more orthodox Egyptologists refer to them by the epithet pyramidiates. So these alternate Egyptologists claim either that the Egyptian civilization itself is much, much older than the archaeological evidence would indicate, or that it was preceded by an ancient super civilization that passed its wisdom and its advanced technology down to the Egyptians. Theories about the identity of these superior ancients range from the survivors of Atlantis to lost Ice Age superhumans to literal aliens. Ancient astronaut theorists suggest that the representation of Kepri as a scarab, and sometimes as a human with a scarab head, may have been inspired by actual contact the Egyptians had with an otherworldly being. Proponents of the alien hypothesis claim that the Egyptian animal-headed gods are actually depictions of the result of alien DNA splicing experiments, that the winged sun disks that show up in Egyptian art are actually flying saucers, and even, I love this one, that the mummification process was an attempt to imitate the suspended animation that the extraterrestrials used during interstellar travel. Amazing. Something else that we see a lot is a persistent desire to trace everything back to Egyptian roots, often saying that Egypt is the oldest or one of the oldest civilizations and that they spread their achievements to the rest of the world, even though it's been shown that there are stone monuments and even mummies from other parts of the world that actually predate the Egyptian ones. Nevertheless, it has been argued by various folks that the cultures of places as distant as China and Ireland originally emerged from Egypt. People have also tried to claim Egyptian origins for things like tarot cards and the 19th century religion of spiritualism, which had to do with seances and talking to ghosts, also something I hope to get back to on this channel. Perhaps the most understandable and interesting case of this happening is the Afrocentric Egyptomania that emerged during the 19th century and was used to argue against racist ideas. These Afrocentric scholars claimed that ancient Egypt was a black civilization, and the fact that all of these later civilizations could trace their culture back to ancient Egypt then became undeniable proof that black people could not possibly be inferior. The problem is that a lot of the claims made by Afrocentrists 
just don't line up with the archaeological evidence any more than the wild speculations that white people have made. So even if the motivation makes total sense, it's just not likely that the theories are true. Another idea that has stuck around is that the Egyptian monuments contain the key to some grand, like, Da Vinci Code-esque mystery. People have tried to mathematically prove that the structure of the Great Pyramid contains, like, prophecies or hidden knowledge. The problem with all of these theories is that they start with the conclusion and then look for evidence to support that conclusion after the fact. So it's been shown that you can do the same thing with the Washington Monument or even like the logo of your local McDonald's. The philosopher Bertrand Russell delivered this sick burn. It is a singular fact that the Great Pyramid always predicts the history of the world accurately up to the date of the publication of the book in question, but after that date it becomes less reliable. <laughs> So now that we've looked at these manifestations of obsession and fascination with Egypt throughout the ages, we can ask ourselves the question, why Egypt? What is it about this place that continues to exert this pull on people even thousands of years after it vanished? Partly, it's got to be because the Egyptian civilization is so, so old, but that they still created things that have persisted into the present day, and that those monuments and that those artifacts that they left behind are aesthetically just gorgeous. But there's also more than that. In this book, Ronald H. Fritz's uh, Egyptomania, A History of Fascination, Obsession, and Fantasy, super recommend it if you want to learn more about this stuff in detail with more examples and like concrete names and dates for some of the things that I've mentioned. So in this book, Fritz suggests that to Westerners, Egypt is both exotic enough to appeal to sort of Orientalist tendencies, and it's also strangely familiar to us from Bible stories, architecture, and popular culture. Egypt is definitely overrepresented in pop culture among other ancient cultures. So just off the top of my head, I can think of things like The Mummy, The Prince of Egypt, Katy Perry's Dark Horse video, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Desert Neopets, this one mini clip game that I never managed to finish and I still think about sometimes. Even like fringe stuff, like message board ghouls who are ironically worshipping the minor chaos deity Keck because they've identified him with Pepe the Frog. Yes, really, that is an actual thing that happened in the world. Clearly, none of this stuff has ever gone away, and it's gonna continue to fascinate generations to come. But I think that it's important to remember that this fascination with Egypt is largely based on stuff that people have made up after the fact. This mythical version of Egypt is enjoyable in its own right for sure, but it is just a myth. So to balance that, we also need to appreciate the contributions of archaeologists and Egyptologists, and we need to listen when they tell us that the ancient Egyptians were ultimately just people. People who lived a very, very long time ago and left behind some really incredible stuff. Stuff which, by the way, should probably be returned to the actual living Egyptians when they ask for it back. Just my two cents. So I think my favorite thing about this enduring obsession with ancient Egypt isn't really what it tells us about the ancient Egyptians at all, but rather what it can teach us about later people who have reacted to the Egyptian culture and appropriated it to serve their own needs or agendas throughout history. I think there's something beautiful about the fact that an ancient Roman or a medieval Muslim could be just as beguiled by the pyramids as a nine-year-old somewhere today. And also something terrifying about the fact that the same sort of crackpot fringe theories keep showing up again and again, even centuries apart. So conclusion, uh, human beings are weird and interesting. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. I'm curious to know if you had an ancient Egypt phase and if so, what got you into it? Did you have like a favorite movie or book that got you hooked? Let me know in a comment below. Like, subscribe, share, you know what to do. You've been on YouTube before. And without further ado, I hope that you'll tune in again for more armchair alchemy in the future and that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.